And so um, without further ado, I'll just hand over to Professor uh, Stuart Burgess. Just a quick reminder of Stuart's background. Stuart is a professor of design and engineering at Bristol University. In fact, Stuart is the leading designer um, in this country. Um, maybe Stuart can tell you about the award he won for that earlier this year and, and probably one of the ones leading designers in the world as well. We can maybe say that, Stuart, as well. Um, but Stuart can tell you about that maybe as he introduces his talk. So Stuart, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, OK, thank you for the introduction, uh, Simon. Yeah. Um, earlier this year, I was awarded the James Clayton uh, Prize uh, because I'm I do a lot of work in designing products uh, like bicycle chains for the Olympics and spacecraft, but I also teach design as well. And one of the things that I teach is a subject called aesthetics, producing beautiful motor cars and other products. Uh, so beauty is something that I actually teach my students at the university and I'll bring in some of that teaching into this talk. So the title is The Beauty of Creation and I will be talking about the origin and the purpose of beauty um, as well. It's quite a good time of year to be thinking of this subject because it's spring and we see the beautiful flowers, we hear the birds singing and we see blue sky. We've seen quite a lot of blue sky recently and it's really encouraging uh, to think about the beauty of creation because we see God's goodness. In fact, in the Bible, it actually says, uh, Jesus said, consider the flowers of the field how God has clothed them with that great uh, beauty. So Jesus himself encourages us to meditate on the beauty of creation, not just flowers, but the whole of creation. And beauty is a really important evidence of design because when we look at the creation, we see beauty for beauty's sake. And, uh, and, and engineers know that that is an important evidence of design. The first time I wrote about this was in 2000. That's when I published the book Hallmarks of Design. And the subtitle there is Evidence of Purposeful Design and Beauty in Nature. And in that book and in the subsequent book, Wonders of Creation, I developed this theme, this hallmark of added beauty, which is a, not just an encouraging evidence of design, but a very powerful evidence of design, as we'll, as we'll see. Now I want to, by way of introduction, just explain this concept of added beauty. And I'm going to do it with the, this, the example of uh, Wells Cathedral. Now Wells Cathedral, it's, uh, is located in the south of England and it's a Gothic uh, cathedral. It was started to be built in the 12th century. So it's a very, very old building, but it's a very beautiful example of Gothic architecture. I was actually invited to speak at Wells Cathedral earlier this year. I was invited by the Bishop of Bath and Wells and I spoke about the beauty of creation. It was actually quite inspiring uh, in such a beautiful building. But I just want to, to explain uh, this concept of added beauty with, with this particular uh, example. <clears throat> so if you look at the, this, this is a picture of the nave uh, and the famous scissor uh, arches uh, right there at the end of the nave. That, that's actually where I was speaking earlier this year. But so what you can see in this cathedral are beautiful features. For example, you see curves, especially in the classic uh, Gothic arch. You also see borders. If you look at the arches, you see most of them have these borders around them. In fact, the borders are actually nested. If you look at one of the main pillars, you can actually see uh, a little cluster of pillars and then another cluster of pillars. And then eventually they all make up to a really big pillar. It's a very clever feature to have this nesting bordering. You also see embellishments. So at the top of the main part of the pillar, you see uh, some carvings for embellishment. And you also see proportion, uh, the length and width of the nave and is a good proportion and there are other good proportions in the cathedral as well. But as well as these individual features, you also have themes. 
So the arch is a very important theme in Wells Cathedral. If you look above the main arches, you can actually see some little arches above. And those little arches don't actually have a function. They're just there, that the beauty for, for beauty's sake to, to promote this theme of arches. Columns are a theme as well. And vaulting in the ceiling uh, is another theme. Now, a key point about these features and themes is that they don't have a physical function. Uh, the nesting, the, the bordering, it doesn't make the columns any stronger. It's beauty for beauty's sake. And that, those beautiful features, that requires a lot of design information. And that information has to come from somewhere. And it comes, of course, from an intelligent designer. And the designers were very good, even in medieval uh, England. So when you see this added beauty, that is a very powerful evidence of design and it also reflects the skill of the designer. And when you study beauty in creation, you see this added beauty, this beauty for beauty's sake. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this, e this evening. I just want to mention at this point how beauty is a challenge to evolution. And I, I just want to illustrate this with a quote from a leading evolutionist, Professor John Maynard Smith. Uh, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. He won a, a Darwin medal, but he made this admission. No topic in evolutionary biology has presented greater difficulties for theorists than beauty. He saw beauty as one of the biggest challenges to evolution. And it wasn't just him. Uh, Charles Darwin himself said that he worried about beauty. He could see that it was a problem for his theory of evolution. Uh, in fact, he said uh, when he considers the peacock feather, it makes him feel sick uh, because he could see that it was very, it was really, really difficult for him to explain how chance could produce the beauty of the peacock feather. So let's consider why is it that beauty is such a challenge to the theory of evolution. Well, we're gonna start with animal uh, colors. I just mentioned a verse from the Old Testament from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter three, where it says, he, that is God has made everything beautiful in its time. That's an important principle. It's not chance that's made things beautiful. It's God that has made things beautiful and it's important to give credit uh, to God when we see the beauty of creation. I'll also just mention a caveat, uh, I'll mention this at the end, but we do live in a fallen world because of the sin and rebellion of Adam and Eve. Uh, creation has been cursed and there are some ugly things in creation. The coronavirus is an ugly thing, but we still see a lot of beauty in creation, even in a fallen world and we're going to focus on the most beautiful parts of creation. So how do we see animal colours? Well this slide uh, summarises the three different ways that we see animal colours. Firstly some animals are coloured by pigments uh, and in the case of birds uh, you see uh, pigments in, in the feathers. So for example um, flamingos and canaries, they eat uh, food which has the carotenoid pigment and that gets into their feathers and that produces either a yellow colour or a pink or an orange colour in the case of the flamingos. Uh, a lot of birds have the melanin pigment, so the thrush looks brown because of the melanin pigment. So pigment colours uh, can give some quite beautiful colours to birds. But the most striking colours in birds actually come from structural colors, sometimes called thin film colors. And these colors are not inherently in the creature themselves, that it's different to a pigment color. The color comes from the reflection of light when it reflects off the surface of the creature. So you have some kind of transparent uh, material in the bird or the beetle or the butterfly. And when light reflects off of it, you get some kind of light interference and hence it's called a structural uh, colour. But sometimes you get combined uh, colours, a combination of a 
pigment color and a structural color. And an example of this would be a green parrot. And often that's produced by a combination of colors like yellow and blue. The yellow would normally be a pigment color from the carotenoid pigment and the blue would be a structural color. And when the two are combined, you get uh, green. I'm gonna focus on the structural colors because they're the most kind of spectacular and complicated. So I'll just uh, focus on the structural colors. And in fact, I'll actually focus on what's called photonic crystals, which sounds complicated, but uh, actually it's just a, a particular type of material. So what is a photonic crystal? A photonic crystal is a structure with regular gaps or features. Uh, and those gaps are comparable with the wavelengths of colored light. So in the, in the middle picture, that block you can see, that's actually an, a man-made engineered uh, crystal. And it's a relatively simple structure, although very difficult to make on a very small scale. It's sometimes called a lattice structure. And the key thing about it is that you have these regular gaps. Each gap is the same distance apart and they're quite precise in, in the size of the gap. And the key point is that the spacing is comparable with the wavelength of certain uh, colored light. So on the right hand side, you can see that the, the different colors have a different wavelength. And when you make these photonic crystals, uh, you design the spacing of the lattice to interfere with a particular color. If you want blue or green, then you have to make the lattice with a different uh, spacing, a different spacing constant. So at the picture on the bottom, you can see what happens when white light, which is made of all the colors, uh, hits the surface, um, a different color is reflected depending on the spacing of that uh, lattice. So you can do some clever things and engineers put in a lot of effort to design these photonic crystals. But it turns out that the best photonic crystals are actually found in creation. The picture at the top uh, shows you what you can see if you look under a very powerful microscope, uh, if you look at the wing of a butterfly. And what you see is a picture of a photonic crystal. So you see uh, these gaps um, regularly spaced. And those gaps are a precise uh, distance um, apart, uh, comparable with the wavelength of some colored light. And a butterfly is, is so well designed that you can have different colors in different places due to a different spacing in the photonic crystal. But what is remarkable is that very complicated processes are required to produce these photonic crystals. And a lot of information has to be there in the genetic code to manufacture these photonic crystals. And not only is there a lot of information, a lot of design that goes in to those crystals and, and the butterfly wings, but you, you end up with these beautiful colors, beautiful patterns, and it is a clear example of added beauty, uh, or, or you could call it over-design, because the butterfly does not need this great level of beauty. A very simple color or a very simple pattern that could be used for a butterfly to recognize its own kind. But a designer, and God being the designer uh, in his goodness has chosen to color butterflies with these beautiful colors and patterns. And to do that, he's created these incredibly intricate uh, photonic crystals and Engineers are struggling to reproduce photonic crystals that are as good as the ones we see in butterflies. And when you think how tiny and delicate a butterfly is, it's remarkable that God should put such beauty in these tiny creatures. But it's not just butterflies that have these amazing photonic crystals. It's also beetles. Uh, we think of a beetle being, a, you know, a not very interesting, uh, creature, but actually some of them are beautifully uh, colored. And scientists have discovered these also have very intricate photonic crystals uh, on their surface, on their shell. 
uh, the pictures shown on the screen, uh, the, the, the pictures of the photonic crystals, they come from the paper referenced at the bottom, which explains that in the case of the beetle, they have three dimensional photonic crystals, a little bit like the man-made one I showed you a couple of slides ago. Very complicated uh, crystals, precision engineering, very difficult to produce. And yet the beetle has these photonic crystals to produce some spectacular colors, stripy patterns, bright colors. Uh, the, the beetle on the, the left at the bottom, that's called a rainbow weevil beetle. Uh, the top one is diamond beetle, some amazing uh, colors. And it's another example of added beauty. Beetles don't need to be so wonderfully colored and yet God in his goodness has decided that uh, beetles should have this wonderful uh, colors or some beetles should be wonderfully uh, colored. So beetles also have these photonic crystals, but it's not just beetles, birds also sometimes have these photonic uh, crystals. And I mentioned the example of the peacock feather. Uh, now you sometimes read peacock feathers have light, have, colored, have colors from thin film interference. Well, it is a type of thin film interference, but specifically uh, it's photonic crystals in those uh, barbs and barbules of the feathers. And the, the picture on the top right is an example of a photonic crystal in a peacock feather. And it comes from the paper referenced uh, at, at the bottom. And the, the top half of that picture shows uh, the green color, the photonic crystal that produces a green color. Below that is a picture of the photonic crystal that produces the brown color. And if you look carefully, you can see that the brown photonic crystal, the spacing is slightly bigger than the spacing in the green photonic crystal. And just below there, you can see uh, in, in that list that the, that the green color has a lattice spacing. That's the spacing between the, the little gaps of 150 nanometers but for the brown, it's 185 nanometers, so it's slightly greater. So remarkably, in the peacock feather, the different colors are produced by that slightly different spacing in, the, in that photonic crystal in, in, in the lattice. So what you have in the peacock feather is this precision engineering. And like the butterfly and the beetle, it takes a lot of genetic information to be able to uh, specify the design and manufacture these amazing photonic crystals. Structural colors are very beautiful because uh, they have a deep luster uh, because of the optical effect and it's also an iridescent color. If you uh, change your angle of view, uh, you actually see a changing color uh, because the different angle makes the light reflect in a, in a different way. So it's wonderful to see these bright colors in creation, an example of added beauty, an example of intelligent design. But I'll just say a few other things about the peacock feather because not only do we see precision design on that microscopic level, but if you look at the whole peacock, you see a wonderfully ordered design. If you look at the, the display of the, the tail feathers when they're deployed, very beautiful, the purpose of that is to form a backdrop to the peacock itself. So to appreciate the beauty of the head and neck of the peacock, uh, behind it, you have this backdrop, which is a beautiful backdrop. Notice the spoked uh, layout of all those feathers. In fact, if you follow carefully the shaft of each feather, you notice how they all come to a point, even the feathers at the bottom are pointing upwards to a particular point. So you, it's not a semicircle uh, backdrop, it's virtually a whole circle. It's a remarkable thing. When you consider that these feathers are deployed by muscles in the bottom of the peacock, it's amazing how it can deploy it with such accuracy. Notice the even spacing of the eye feathers. Again, that's remarkable when you think this is deployed. Um, then notice the crown feathers on top of the peacock's head. You can just see them in this picture. 
Why are they called crown feathers? Well, there is this royal theme to the peacock. Uh, you also have an eye border to emphasize the eye, and you have this royal blue color of the neck uh, feathers. So you have a royal blue uh, and this royal theme. You remember earlier, I said that Wells Cathedral has particular themes, the Gothic arch. Well, in the peacock, we see themes, we see the eye theme, and we see the royal theme, the royal uh, blue. And uh, I discussed a little bit about this in a, in a paper referenced at the bottom, Journal of Optics and Laser Technology, the Institute of Physics. But just to mention a, just a few more features of the, the peacock, just going back to the eye feather, there are some subtle details like you have these mathematical shapes, for example, the arch, a little bit like the Gothic arch that I was speaking about earlier. And not just those particular shapes, but you see borders. Notice around the eye feather you have outside the goldy brown, you have a lighter brown border and then a darker border. Also notice at the top of the feather, there is an empty border. Now, I think that is really just astounding because an empty border is a very clever uh, feature. It contrasts with the colored borders. But to produce an empty border is quite a complicated thing because those barbs have to be missing the hairs on the barb uh, in order to produce this gap. Uh, and so there's genetic information saying, well, have a gap by missing some hairs. And it's all aligned to produce a very precise um, arch-like border at the very top. Now, how can chance just produce this really subtle, amazing uh, feature? And that is one of the reasons why John Maynard Smith said, beauty is one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problem to evolution. How can it explain these subtle features also notice there's no stem in the uh, upper section of the eye feather. Uh, the reason, well, the reason why there's no stem in the top is because it increases the beauty of that eye pattern. If you had a stem going all the way through that, that eye pattern, it would kind of disrupt uh, the beauty of those shapes. And so there isn't a stem. The reason there isn't a stem is that the barbs gradually point upwards. And again, you need a lot of genetic information to make this possible for there not to be a stem in the top half of the, the pattern. But again, this is purposeful, intentional design to make uh, beauty. I could also mention other subtle details like the narrow brown stem at the bottom. If you look at the width of the stem, it's a very narrow stem. The reason it's narrow is because it can be very deep. And the reason it's narrow is again, not to interrupt the beauty of that uh, eye feather. So we can see many subtle uh, features and we could go on to speak about the loose and tight barbs in the eye pattern itself. The barbs are very tight, but if you go outside the eye pattern, the barbs become very loose. You have many, many subtle uh, features of beauty. The, the peacock uh, is a great marvel of um, beauty and design. But now I want to go to another section, and this one is on the beauty of plants. And the Bible has a couple of verses relating to this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. It's very easy to miss that little phrase, pleasant to the sight. But what that means is that God deliberately made trees to be beautiful. There's added beauty. There's this beauty for beauty's sake. Trees are beautiful. They're beautiful because God designed them to be beautiful. And as I said earlier, Jesus mentions the beauty of flowers. Consider the lilies of the field. Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And uh, Jesus goes on to say, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, surely he will 
excuse me. Just need to. Uh, sorry about that. Someone was just calling me. Uh, just switch that off. Um, so Jesus was saying one of the reasons you should uh, study beauty in creation is to be encouraged of God's care. If God cares so much uh, for, for flowers, for tiny little flowers, how much more should he care for us? So it's good to study the beauty of plants. Well, we can start with uh, trees. One of the reasons for the beauty of trees is the great variety, more than 50,000 species of tree from very small, like, uh, like the bonsai tree that can fit on a table, to the giant sequoia tree up to a thousand tons in weight and up to two billion leaves on it. And you see a great variety of uh, colors and leaf shapes. So the sheer size and variety of trees uh, itself is, a, is, a, is an aspect of beauty. Uh, here are some of my favorite uh, trees. I love copper beeches, um, you know, having that kind of copper color rather than green. Uh, cherry blossom is one of my favorite uh, trees. And I do love jacaranda trees that are common in South America. Amazing purple uh, blossom in the spring. With trees, you combine this magnificent uh, beauty, their, their size and their scale, but also sometimes a delicate beauty with their, with their blossom. Uh, so, so trees are wonderful. And uh, th th I think this is a picture from the United States in, in Virginia. Uh, you get wonderful autumn uh, colors with trees. In the autumn, the leaves die, the chlorophyll goes, and when the chlorophyll goes, the green goes, it then shows other pigments that were already in the leaf and leaves often have reddish orange pigments. And when the chlorophyll goes, you get these beautiful colors in the, in the autumn. So trees are very, very beautiful. But flowers, of course, are particularly uh, beautiful. And I should mention here that uh, Darwin uh, acknowledged that flowers presented a problem to evolution. Uh, when he looked at the fossil record, when, when he studied plants, uh, he admitted that it's very difficult to explain how the beauty of flowers could have evolved. Flowers have many beautiful features. They have soft textures. If you feel the, the texture of a petal, it's remarkably smooth and beautiful. Uh, just feel the surface of a man-made flower and touch the petal and it feels a little bit like sandpaper. But in comparison, flowers have very, very soft uh, petals. Flowers have very bright colors, very intricate shapes, sometimes very complex patterns and often sweet smells. And scents and smells are not simple. They're a very complicated thing. A scent is produced by a volatile organic compound called VOCs that vaporize to release molecules. It's a complicated thing, but each flower has up to 150 types of different odor molecules. And so every flower has its own unique combination uh, of odor molecules and unique uh, scent. And the fact that companies can make a lot of money uh, producing perfume from flowers shows uh, that people really appreciate the scent of flowers. At this time of year in the spring, we often appreciate bluebells. The reason bluebells come out in the spring is that uh, in the forest, uh, a lot of sunlight is still coming in because the leaves are not fully grown. And so you often see bluebells in the forest uh, before it becomes too dark. And uh, bluebells have a particular pigment, um, a very special pigment that gives the blue uh, color. And th these pigments are very complicated uh, things. I uh, just to give you here an example of buttercups. Sometimes we think of a buttercup as being like a weed in the in the in the garden, but buttercups are not weeds. They're wonderful uh, flowers. At the bottom is is a, a journal paper, Journal of the Royal Society Interface, where scientists uh, studied the buttercup 
and they were amazed at the intricacy of design. And they showed that the yellow comes from a carotenoid pigment in the, the layer of the petals. The layer has these two films that reflect light and it gives this strong glossy um, surface to the buttercup, which is why if you hold a buttercup to your cheek, uh, you can actually get a glow on your cheek because of the, the glossiness and engineers would love to copy uh, that. So even in a humble buttercup, uh, it's a wonderful example of design. Of course, uh, some flowers are cultivated, many roses are cultivated, uh, lilies. At the bottom you can see some orchids. But it's God who has created the genetic potential for many flower designs. Uh, God wants us to cultivate flowers to produce other colours and other shapes. It's God who has put that genetic potential there in the first place. So flowers are a wonderful example of added beauty, uh, a great example of God's uh, goodness to give us these wonderful plants to appreciate and enjoy. But when we look at the countryside as a whole, we see a beautiful colour scheme. And this cannot be by chance. We see a contrast between the sky and the land. Often we, we, we have a, a green land or a brown land, and that contrasts with a blue sky. Uh, it would be very odd if uh, the land was blue and the sky was blue. But so we have this wonderful contrast and blue and green are also restful colours. Uh, and that shows God's goodness. He wants us to, to, to have this restful view of the green land and the blue sky. And it just so happens that green is really the best background color for the bright colors of uh, flowers. And we even find that blue is an uncommon color in wild plants. And in a way that makes sense because if the sky is dominated by blue, well, actually you'd want blue to be more of an unusual color on the land. So we see this amazing uh, colour scheme and when I'm teaching my students I'll mention some of these features to them uh, to learn from the beauty of creation. But now I want to move on to the beauty of birdsong uh, and a lot of what I'm going to mention comes from one particular book called Birdsong, The Biology of Vocal Communication by W.H. Thorpe. Uh, he was a professor at Cambridge University, and that book is Cambridge University uh, Press. Now, if you were to show this music to a musicologist, well, if you showed them the top line and you said, who do you think composed that? They would say, well, that, that could be someone like J.S. Bach because he composed very melodic music. And indeed it was, it was by J.S. Bach, that top uh, piece of, of music. If you were to say to a musicologist, who do you think composed the bottom uh, piece of music? Uh, and they would say, well, that could also be J.S. Bach because it also has that similar kind of musicality. If you told them, well, actually the bottom piece of music is sung by a blackbird, uh, they would probably be quite surprised because a blackbird does not have a degree in music, uh, has never been taught music, but it remarkably, uh, many songbirds like blackbirds, robins and nightingales do sing with an astonishing degree of musicality. I'll just put down a list here of the musical features in both of those pieces of music. Both of them have rhythm, there's a time signature, melody, there's a key signature. They both have two phrases marked one and two. Uh, and the phrases are kind of complement each other. Both of the pieces of music start on the key note, which is C. Uh, the first phrase in both cases ends with anticipation by a small uh, interval. Uh, that's one way you connect two phrases in, in music. Both of the phrases end with what's called binality. So the music by J.S. Bach ends with a major third, an E and a C. The music by the blackbird, will it end with an inverted major third? And uh, because in music, uh, you, there are particular intervals that will kind of finish a piece of music and birds will even use those intervals in the same way as human composers. 
And both pieces of music have significant top notes because they come from the arpeggio of the key signature. So it turns out that songbirds don't sing random songs. Sometimes when you hear a songbird, you might think that sounds like a random song. It's not a random song. They have particular songs in their head and they repeat them with great accuracy. If you listen to your local uh, blackbird or robin, and with this confinement, it's a good time to listen to your local songbirds. Listen carefully from one day to another, and gradually you'll hear that they have particular songs in their repertoire, and the same songs will come out and will be sung exactly as they were uh, before. So it's, there's amazing musicality in the songs of songbirds. Just to mention a few other uh, features, well, I've mentioned memorized uh, songs. Some birds will sing with perfect pitch. So if they're singing a song in D major on a Monday, then as they go through the week, it will also be in D major because they have perfect uh, pitch. Very few human singers have perfect pitch, but uh, some birds have that. Some birds will even inherit a song from their parents. Uh, tests have been done where the offspring of, of some birds have been separated from their parents, they've never heard their parents, seen their parents, and yet they will produce exactly the same songs as their parents, showing that that music is written in the DNA. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? Some birds will transpose from a minor key to a major key, back to a minor key. Not that many musicians can do that. Birds can sing uh, very fast, and some Birds have many songs in their repertoire. The, uh, the record is actually the nightingale that can have up to 300 songs in its repertoire. That is another example of added beauty. Uh, birds don't need to sing beautiful songs and a nightingale does not need to have 300 songs in its repertoire, but it's pleased God in his goodness uh, to make songbirds to sing beautiful songs. God has also got those birds to fly to our gardens to bring the beauty right to, to us. That's God's goodness. And it's a wonderful example of added beauty and God's design. Just to show you a couple of other interesting features, especially to any musicians uh, listening. One study was carried out to compare the musicality of J.S. Bach with some songbirds. And what they did was they looked through a big section of the music of J.S. Bach and they did a survey to find out, well, how many intervals did he have that were pleasant sounding, like consonant intervals, and how many were not so pleasant sounding, that's the dissonant intervals, uh, like a minor seventh, I think. Um, and they then compared that with the music of an African Shrike. So they studied the bird song, the, the songs of the African strike. They did another survey. How many consonant intervals, pleasant sounding intervals, like the major fifth, major third, how many dissonant intervals. And astonishingly, they found more purity in the music of the African strike than even J.S. Bach. They were not expecting uh, to find that. But the key point here is that if birds just sang random notes, then you would have an equal number of all of those different intervals. But you can quite clearly see that there is this uh, preference for melodically sounding uh, intervals. J just a couple of other really interesting examples of bird song. Uh, it's been found that some birds, including the African shrike, will sing a precision duet so you can see bird X and bird Y. You can see bird X is singing the upper notes and bird Y is singing the lower notes. Uh, it's normally a mating pair that uh, do this. Now to sing a duet, both birds need to know what the music is and they need to know what the key signature is, the timing is. Uh, human singers will tell you that uh, it, it takes a lot of care and attention to sing a duet, and yet birds can do that. More astonishingly, uh, the African shrike will sometimes sing in a quartet. Two 
mating birds, X, Y, U, V, will uh, actually sing a quartet. And that is really just astounding because all four birds must know what the music is and the timing and the key signature. They have to really uh, cooperate. So it's a, a remarkable evidence of design and beauty. But I want to give you a couple of quotes from that professor at Cambridge University, Professor W.H. Thorpe. He said he believed in evolution. However, he made some really remarkable admissions in his writings where he clearly seemed to have doubts about evolution in the case of his field, uh, birdsong. And he said this, it is hard to imagine any selective reason for the extreme purity of some bird notes. And then he said, we do find a great deal of elaboration which goes beyond anything which would seem to be biologically advantageous. Now, these are amazing admissions by a leading evolutionist. The reason he's making these admissions is this, according to evolution, you can never produce any kind of feature unless there is a selective advantage. Evolution never produces over design. It's, everything has to have some functional advantage. And yet Professor Thorpe is saying he cannot see what is the selective reason? What is the advantage of this great beauty? And he said other similar statements in his uh, writings. So I want to move on uh, to sea creatures, just a few slides on this. And just to mention a couple of Bible verses from Genesis 1. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. And in Psalm 104, it says, this great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. Well, here's a, a picture of uh, something very great and some smaller things. I'm sure you've seen natural history programs like Blue Planet 1, Blue Planet 2, with some amazing pictures of great sea creatures, tiny sea creatures. God obviously enjoyed uh, creating such uh, an abundance and variety of beautiful sea creatures. Recently, we've been seeing uh, pictures of deep sea creatures, if you watch Blue, Blue Planet 2. And amazingly, uh, there's an abundance of creatures in the deep sea where it's very dark, very barren. And many of those creatures are very beautiful and, and highly colored uh, as well. Another example of added beauty. Just to mention one particular example uh, on the theme of sea, sea creatures, mollusks like oysters can produce pearls. Now, I don't know if, if you knew this, but a pearl starts off usually as a piece of grit or contaminant in the oyster. And the oyster responds to that contaminant by covering it in layers of calcium carbonate. And you have layer upon layer. It takes time, but gradually a pearl is produced, which can be really quite big. And in that pearl, you get structural coloring by all the layers of calcium carbonate. So what that means is when light reflects off of the pearl, you get this reflection interference with those layers, you get structural colouring, a deep luster, an iridescent colour that changes with the angle of view, and you get these creamy beautiful colours and people will pay large sums of money, especially for natural uh, pearls. Very, very beautiful. But isn't it interesting how God can change a tiny bit of dirt and change it into something that is so beautiful. That uh, just shows the power, the wisdom, the goodness of God. Very briefly, a mention about snow. In Job chapter 38 in the Old Testament, it says, have you entered the treasury of snow? That's a fascinating verse because in the Old Testament, they didn't have microscopes. So how did they know that uh, there was a beautiful treasury in snow? Uh, I think that was inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
because snow is very beautiful. Every snowflake is unique with those hexagonal patterns. It comes from the design of the water molecule, which has two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom, and the spacing of those uh, hydrogen atoms uh, gives you this amazing structure that can produce beautiful hexagonal patterns that with the help of microscopes we can now uh, appreciate, especially. And of course, when you get a blanket of snow, uh, especially when it's fresh, uh, it just uh, it gives you a different view of the beauty of the countryside and creation. We haven't had too much of that this last uh, winter in the United Kingdom. Then a brief mention about the stars. Uh, another quotation from the book of Job, this time from chapter 26, verse 13. It says, by his spirit, he adorned the heavens. That's a fascinating verse because what it really is saying is by God's spirit, he beautified the heavens. And just like the trees, what we're being told is that God deliberately made the stars, the heavens, to be beautiful. God didn't just want us to have beautiful views during the daytime. He wanted to, us to have beautiful views in the nighttime. So beauty is a deliberate thing. It's not just some kind of accident uh, or feature of creation. When we study the planets, uh, we can see great beauty, the patterns on Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, uh, the variety of uh, the planets. We see great beauty there. But when we look into the universe, it, all the galaxies, the stars, the Milky Way, uh, even a dying star producing nebula, very colorful, uh, we see a great variety of shapes, great, great variety of color. In fact, every color we see uh, in, in space. God is an artist. He loves beauty. He loves color and shapes, and he's filled the universe uh, with great uh, beauty. Uh, the universe has been described as having a majestic beauty. The most beautiful thing in the universe, well, it's the earth. Uh, in recent years, uh, scientists have been studying extrasolar planets. One of the things that they've concluded is that the Earth is very beautiful and it is unique, a unique blue-green planet, uniquely holding life. Then finally, man. One of the reasons we are fearfully and wonderfully made is that uh, humans are very beautiful of course, every animal is beautiful in its own way, but there is a unique, delicate beauty to man. This is Vitruvian man, uh, famously drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he had the square because if you put your arms out right, if you're an adult, you fit inside a square. And if you do a star jump, you fit inside a circle, the center of the circle being your belly button. You have these interesting proportions to the body but not only that, uh, and also the, the upright stature is elegant as well, but also humans have that fine uh, hair and fine facial features, and of course, made in the image of God. That's what makes humans really special. Well, I mentioned the caveat at the beginning, the effect of the fall, and just to repeat that. Now, sadly, there was a rebellion of Adam and Eve, they, they sinned, they fell, and uh, that sin spread to all men, we're told in the New Testament. We're all sinners because of that. But because of the fall, the ground was cursed, and that brought death, disease, and decay into the world. So the world today is not as beautiful as it would have been in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were first created. But creation still reveals great beauty and design. But now I briefly want to look at the purpose of beauty, and I've got two points here. One of the purposes of beauty is to reveal the creator, as we read in Romans 1.20. Creation reveals not just that there is a creator, but his attributes. It reveals his glory, his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. When you look at the beauty of birds and flowers, 
uh, God's glory, power, wisdom and goodness is revealed. But secondly, beauty is there for our enjoyments. Uh, in 1 Timothy, we're told that God has, has given us richly all things to enjoy. And one of the purposes of beauty is for us to enjoy creation. The psalmist says, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. And we have been designed to appreciate beauty. Part of our brain is dedicated to the appreciation of beauty, musical beauty and visual beauty. We are designed uh, to enjoy things. But then finally, I want to briefly talk about the beauty of God's kingdom because uh, beauty is a very important concept. It's not just a physical thing. It's also a spiritual thing. The Bible speaks the beauty of God's kingdom and it's even more important to appreciate that than even the beauty of creation. Psalm 27 speaks of beholding the beauty of the Lord. Why is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, why is he beautiful? Well, partly because of that inner beauty, his perfection. He was without sin. He was beautiful because of his glory. Glory is a beautiful thing and Jesus uh, had that glory which people be beheld. Uh, majesty gives beauty and Jesus uh, is the king of kings and therefore he has that majestic beauty and also because of his love for his people and his love for the world that also creates a beauty as well. So we have a beautiful savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, there's the beauty of God's uh, people spoken of in 1 Peter 3, where uh, we're encouraged to have that gentle and quiet spirit. Uh, the New Testament speaks of the fruits of the spirit, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. Obviously, Christians are not perfect. They, they still sin, but because of the help of the Holy Spirit, every Christian to some degree has the beauty of those fruits of the Spirit. And here, just to share with you a wonderful verse from Psalm 149, verse 4, where it says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. That's a it's a wonderful promise, and it kind of reminds me of uh, that picture of the pearl, God taking something that's not beautiful and then making it incredibly beautiful. God takes uh, a sinner like ourselves. We're, we're sinners before God. We don't have any righteousness ourselves, and yet uh, God can save us by clothing us in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who never sinned. And when we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we're then crowned with honor and glory, as the psalmist says, we're cleansed from sin, made fit for heaven and beautified. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, promise and picture there in the psalm. Then Psalm 50 speaks of the beauty of heaven. In fact, it says out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Isn't it interesting that it speaks of the perfection of beauty? In this world, we see glimpses of beauty. In heaven, it will be the very definition, the very perfection of beauty with no sin, uh, no death, no suffering, no cancer, and precious materials will be common not uncommon uh, like here and God's people will be beautiful as, as we were reading in from Psalm 149 and then finally uh, one more reference to spiritual beauty praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful uh, people sometimes say to me what is the the clearest example of design in the world and I say well it's it's difficult because we see design everywhere but one particular example would be the human voice uh, when you think of the beauty of the human voice when it's singing uh, 
that, that's a wonderful evidence of design. God has designed us to sing and to sing praise to God. That is very beautiful. And that's mentioned in this Psalm 147. Praise is beautiful. We are designed to have fellowship with God. We're designed to sing praises to God. It's one of the most wonderful things we can do. It's a wonderful thing to go to church, to be together with other people, to praise God. Uh, at the moment, that's not possible for many people, uh, but we can still praise God in our hearts or in our homes uh, on our own or with our families. Some brief conclusions. Without Christ, beauty is diminished. Here's a really interesting quote from Darwin's autobiography. I have said that in one respect, my mind has changed during the last 20 or 30 years. I have almost lost my taste for pictures or music. I retain some taste for the fine scenery, but it does not cause me the exquisite delight which it formerly did. And I've heard this from other atheists. As, as time goes on, they lose an appetite for beauty. But here's a, a verse from uh, a hymn written by George Wade Robinson. Heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green, something lives in every hue, priceless eyes have never seen, birds with gladder songs are flow, flowers with deeper beauty shine, since I know, as now I know, I am his, and he is mine. If you become a Christian, beauty becomes more precious and more clear. Going back to that verse I have quoted at the beginning, Ecclesiastes 3, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. Uh, all of us are spiritual beings. And if we think about it, we can see that spiritual yearning in our hearts. Um, God has made us to appreciate uh, beauty and we cannot be rest. Uh, we, we cannot be at peace until we find uh, God. So I hope you find that encouraging that God has revealed himself through beauty, that God wants us to appreciate uh, beauty. But most of all, I encourage you to meditate on the beauty of God's uh, kingdom. You can read more details, uh, especially in our recent book published this with Andy McIntosh, uh, edited by Brian Edwards, Wonders of Creation, uh, but also other books and DVDs that uh, go into more detail about this, this important topic and encouraging topic of beauty. So thank you and God bless. Thanks, Stuart, for uh, reminding us of those important things, not just physical beauty in creation, but the spiritual um, beauty that we also see. Um, just so you know, if you are interested in those products, you can find them uh, on the Answers in Genesis web store. The link is in the comment section below. And just to remind you that there's 20% of all our resources um, at the moment. And if you just type Matthew 6 in, when you go out to, to, to check out at the store, then you'll receive that 20%. Um, Stuart, can I just ask um, a quick question? Um, does do we see a, a degrading of, of beauty in creation? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, in fact, uh, there has been a paper written on the peacock and uh, the very title uh, in, implies that the researchers were quite surprised that when they studied generations of the peacock, they noticed a, a degradation of beauty, which is exactly what creationists predict because creationists do predict that things change. Either they adapt, uh, or they decay. And every year we see creatures becoming extinct. We, we, we do see a decaying of creation, including a decay of beauty. And so that obviously indicates it having been created rather than it having evolved step by step over time, because obviously if it was evolved, then it would be getting better rather than becoming worse. Yeah, exactly. Evolution predicts uh, beauty increasing, complexity increasing. But when we actually look at creation, we see a lot of complexity, a lot of information, a lot of beauty, exactly as creationists have predicted. And as you say, exactly what evolution would not predict. 
And so we would have seen a much more beautiful world um, before the fall of Adam. And we can also look forward to a much more beautiful world in the new heavens and new earth. Exactly. Things will be restored. And as we read in uh, Romans chapter eight, the, the whole of creation is going to be redeemed, no, not just us, but creation itself. And that beauty will be uh, redeemed as well. OK, well, thank you, Stuart, for your time this evening. Um, we've been all there's lots of good comments in the comment section. Thanking you um, for, 